everybody, and thank you for joining us by Zoom or by Facebook Live. This is a Code Pink webinar to talk about the upcoming delegation, um, Citizen Diplomacy Peace Delegation to Iran, being led by Code Pink. And I'm Arielle Gold. I'm the Code Pink National Co-Director, and I'm here with Leila Zand, who is organizing our future trips to Iran and two of the uh, previous delegates, one of the previous co-leaders of our peace delegations to Iran. And we're going to talk about uh, what it's like to travel to Iran and uh, answer any questions of people looking to sign up. So Leila, I wanted to start by just asking you to introduce yourself a little bit, and um, then we will go directly to uh, John, who only has a short amount of time, to ask him what it was like to travel with us last fall to Iran. And I see we have a number of people joining in by Zoom. And I want to encourage them, if you have questions, to type those questions in the box, and we will answer them. So, Leila, if you can just say a few words about your experience and um, what it's, you know, what you're hoping for as you plan this next Code Pink trip to Iran. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Yes, my name is Leila, Leila Zand. I'm an Iranian-American work on the area of peace uh, and reconciliation between the United States and different countries within the Middle East, most specifically Iran. I have um, worked on the area of citizen diplomacy or track to diplomacy. And citizen diplomacy is known also as track to diplomacy. Um, for more than a decade, I started the Fellowship of Reconciliation and mostly focused on uh, interfaith dialogue and negotiations and um, into women communications or many different areas of communications and basically uh, resolving conflicts through uh, relationship and through dialogue. So we know that uh, what we call it citizen diplomacy, it start, it's, has a very young history. It started in the early 80s um, and mostly is focused on countries that often United States doesn't have a relationship with, and there is no communication politically between the track one diplomacy politicians with one another. So that is the time we, the people who mostly suffer from lack of communication and lack of diplomacy between the two countries, we uh, start to work around that and we want to create the peace. So I think it's very important because we, two people from Iran, and from the United States, we don't know each other. And anything we know is through filters of our governments and mostly they introduce us to one another as the enemy. And we always have fear from one another. So what is the best way to go and see and meet the enemy and see you know, their country? It is really unfortunate that many Iranian cannot come to the United States as citizen diplomats, but if we have this opportunity, we should use it. I have sent more than 15 uh, delegations and more than like 300 Americans to Iran and every and each one of them came back safe and sound and in one piece. <laughs> and so um, I'm here to the end of this call and we'll be happy to answer any questions if there is any. So I see that we have close to 30 people that are here by Zoom, and I see that we have some questions already about the process of attaining a visa, but I want to begin because John only has a limited amount of time with us, you know, with a really open question to you, John, were you afraid to travel to Iran? And what was it like for you to make that decision and to, in fact, travel to Iran? Uh, thanks. Can you hear me, Ariel? I can, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, um, I was not afraid to travel to Iran, but pretty much everybody around me was. <laughs> my my family, friends, people said, why do you want to go to Iran? The usual thing that you kind of hear when you say you're going to Iran. But I personally was not concerned, although, as you know, last year between April and when we went in October and continuing on to today, 
tensions were very high and there were a lot of obstacles, you know, that looked like they could prevent us from going. And so that was a concern, but I wasn't really afraid. I, you know, I knew people who'd been um, from Code Pink and, and uh, they told me it was great and I figured it would be. Uh, so no, I, you know, once, once we were on the ground, as you know, because you were right there beside me and the others, um, we had a great trip. Um, and I think maybe a lot of my family and friends who were really concerned, and even those who advised me not to go, were perhaps surprised when they heard from me, even while I was in Iran, I was, you know, FaceTiming or whatever with them and, and speaking to them from Iran. And they were just uh, delighted to see that, you know, we had a good time and we had no problems at all. Great. So the first question that we have is last year, there was approximately a two month delay between when the visas were approved and when they were finally issued and whether we anticipate this kind of thing. So I want to pose that as well to Amber, who traveled twice last year with Code Pink to Iran and was a co-leader of the second delegation. And, and I, I know Amber very well personally because we're dear friends and live in the same town. And I know that she is somebody who likes things to be done nice and early. And that's <laughs> not the way things work <laughs> with uh, visas to Iran. So if you could tell us just uh, what that process was like for you, because I'll answer very quickly. Sure. Yes, it, it can be up to the last minute. Yeah, so today is actually the one year anniversary from when I first went to Iran. Today I landed in Tehran this time last year. And last year our date changed um, to a date we originally had not anticipated. And I literally got my visa three days before we were supposed to go. So a little stress inducing, but that's again, how things happen. You don't really know. Um, the information gets sent, sent to the Pakistani embassy in Washington, DC, if you're coming from the United States. So we had to mail our passport there and then have it sent back if you're not in DC. Um, more recently though, when I went in October, I think we got our visas maybe, or at least I got my visa maybe a week before week, week and a half. I don't know. It was, it was a little bit sooner, but you really can't anticipate. Um, there's a limited number of days as Americans that we are allowed in the country um, and information has to be sent to the Pakistani embassy since there is no um, Iranian embassy, since we don't have those diplomatic relations. So if you're adventuresome and you trust the process and <laughs> you're okay with things being last minute, or even if you're not, that's what you're going to have to deal with if you want to go to Iran. So Leila, I want to, um, you know, throw it to you to say, because you were actually the one who obtained our visas each time last year, and you'll be the one who obtains them this time, what that process is like to give people sort of a feel for it. But before I do that, I want to let people know who are thinking about signing up for the trip that you can go to code pink slash Iran and you will see the link to sign up. It's a $200 deposit. And you have to also fill out an application for your visa. And we recommend you do that immediately. And I want to let folks know that we have tips for fundraising if you're looking to fundraise for your trip. And that we also have a scholarship for um, young activists of color. And we encourage folks to donate to that scholarship and we encourage young activists of color to apply for that. So Leila, if you could talk a little bit about what that visa process will look like for folks who are thinking of signing up. You're on mute, oh. Leila. Unmute. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My dog was here, I'm making noise, so I had to mute myself. <laughs> so um, visa process, any time that um, we come to that air in time of applying for the visa and go through the process, I feel that I'm working for NASA because it's very difficult. And it's very <laughs> complicated process, not for you guys, for people who want to apply. I think we tried our best to make this the easiest for you. So you can go online as Ariel mentioned and uh, fill out your application. And from then on, 
uh, we will go through the process and we definitely will communicate and we try our best to communicate clearly with you and ask the information we need. But the difficulty that I mentioned is from our end because most of the time, as I mentioned, I have worked on this um, on this area for 10 years and I'm working with Iranian to issue the visa for individuals here in the United States or around the world it's very easy to get a visa for people from other countries. But unfortunately, probably that is the reason we want to go to Iran to break this barrier. Unfortunately for Americans, obtaining visa is very difficult. And again, it's because of lack of trust. Mm -hmm. And many times happen that Iran, that American wanna go there and they try to make it easy for us. For example, let me just say this in this way. I have an experience. It was a couple of years ago. We had a group of Iranian um, scholars to come and visit the United States. At their entrance, they had fingerprinting in the, in the airport in the, in the US. So when the next time we want to send a delegation to Iran, and while we never had that experience, suddenly they brought you know stuff to do the fingerprinting of an American delegation. And I was surprised. I said, what is going on? We never had this process. And they said, why we sent our delegation there and American did it, you know, for our group. So it's a lot of that is tit for tat. So we should keep this in mind. It's not only us, you know, only lack of trust, but a lot of that also, they want to do something because the you know, US um, government has done something to them. But also I want to say, there are a complicated process for American because they have to go through the whole background and all the information you provide. And um, you, you all know better than me that why is that? Because of lack of relationship between the two government or two country in the past 40 years. It is very unfortunate, but it's not in our control is not in our hand, neither me nor anyone from Code Pink or even our hosts in Iran, because people who issue the visa is not any of us. Whatever we do is just providing the material they need for issuing the visa for the individuals here. And we do our best. So each one of you get your visa, at least we want to have that at least a month earlier than the trip. But sometimes, as Amber mentioned, it happened most of the time. It happened in the last minute, in three days, a week before the trip. Sometimes, unfortunately, I have to be really um, uh, true about that, that sometimes happened that the visa actually, we got it just on the day for the people who wanted to travel. And there were other, there were other times that it was a week earlier. So I, I and I think, the code ping cannot promise anything on what day exactly the visa will issue. And um, the one thing that I, it always made me hopeful and comfortable only was because people who take this trip are really peace loving people. And they go through, like John mentioned, just convincing their families and everyone is so worried in a base, you know, in, in the first place that why are in all of these places you want to go to Iran? So because they are really committed to their mission of peace building. So what makes me to be hopeful is that people understand this and they know in these conditions, in these situations, no one really none of us, at least, we don't have the power to make the change that we want in, in regarding of the visa, of course, that we want in that last minute or in, in through the process. But the process is we get all your information, we send them. So the material is basically your visa application, the $200 you will send to Code Pink, and that is for us to make sure you are coming and reserve your seat and then your visa application, a page of your passport, the first page of your passport. And um, that's it. For Americans, there are a little more detail they need, like who was your employer, employee probably 10 years ago. Even if you are retired, you need to let them know that, you know, who was the people whom you worked for before. Um, one other thing I want to mention about the $200. If for any reason 
we have to cancel the trip, either for the, they didn't issue the visa for you, or for some reason, you know, we decided for Code Pink decided, you know, there is some stuff that we cannot continue that and we have to cancel. Like the coronavirus, which yes. somebody asked about, which is out exactly. of our control. Exactly. It's not on our control. We know we follow the news. We know in Iran is dealing with this problem currently. And we know they are doing their best to control it, but no one knows. If they couldn't control till the time we want to go, if we decided it's not safe for our delegate to go because of the virus, so then we have to cancel the trip and we return your $200. We are not going to keep that. Um, so be comfortable if you are worried about the virus or you are worried that you know we, you don't get the visa and you will lose your $200. No, you will return it. You will you will get it back. We will return it to you. So. Um... And we were getting a lot of questions about that, about the coronavirus and, and so on, things that are out of our control. But I want to switch a little bit and ask, you know, kind of this question of why visit Iran? And so I want to ask uh, both John and Amber, what was the most interesting, most important part of your visit to Iran? Why would you recommend this to the next people to go on this delegation? And I'll start with you, John. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, there are many reasons. I mean, I, I think obviously if, if you're somebody who's considering going in the first place, clearly you have an interest in Iran and you have an interest in uh, forging a better relationship between uh, the U.S. or other countries and Iran. And because there's so much isolation and there's so little contact, direct contact, especially from the U.S. side, um, you have an opportunity by going with Code Pink, as we did, you have an opportunity to play a direct and immediate role in, in being a human face, being an, an American face or a face of whatever country you're from, and contacting people in the country, seeing for yourself, experiencing, not just reading reports, not just reading the news, not just watching TV or whatever, experiencing it for yourself. And you have the opportunity to make that human connection, which there's no substitute for that. So just being there is one, fascinating and incredible, I found. And two, it just... You have, a, you have a chance to have an immediate impact. Whatever you do when you're there, people are going to respond to. They're going to say, oh, this is, for example, if you are American or wherever you're from, they'll, okay, here's my experience with John, the American, and this is, this is what, you know, this is what I learned from that person and what you learned from them. So you have an, a, ch a chance to have that, and there's no substitute for that. So I mean, there are many things that were valuable about that trip that we went on in October, but just that human connection with everybody from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep, you're constantly encountering other people. And uh, there's, you can't put a price tag on that. It was, it was great. I would, I would go back in a heartbeat. So Amber, you did go back in a heartbeat, <laughs> but before I pass the same question on to you, um, I, I want to briefly acknowledge the two questions that have been asked. One is, will disabilities be accommodated? And I wanna say that we do our very best, but it does depend on the disability. And I wanna ask you to contact, send an email to Leila, L-E-I-L-A at codepink.org. If you forget that email, you can send it to info at codepink.org. And uh, I also see somebody asking about the dates of the trip and the costs. The dates are approximately, and the very details of this could change, but approximately uh, um, May 25 through June 4. And the costs are approximately $3,200, and that would include your airfare. And the reason I say approximately is that would depend on the airfare. So it could go, could go slightly down or slightly up. Again, you can contact Layla at codepink.org or info at codepink.org. And now, Amber, I want to turn it over to you and say what compelled you to go and then 
quickly sign up to to go again. What was so fascinating um, about Iran? Sure. Well, I think it's kind of to piggyback on what John said, the fact that we, um, as Americans, we know very little about Iran. We, um, <laughs> we have no diplomatic relations with Iran. Um, there's a lot of warmongering and misinformation in our media. And a lot of people, unless they're focusing back to a certain point in history, you know, they don't really understand the relationship with, between the United States and Iran. For Americans, you know, we, a lot of people refer back to the Iran hostage crisis, you know, in the 70s, and they don't understand the history of what led up to that, how in 1953, um, the US, the CIA led a coup of Iran's democratically elected government of Mossadegh and <laughs> put the Shah into power, who was uh, brutal, but, you know, uh, helped with US interest and goes back to oil and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of Americans do not understand that history. Um, they don't understand um, the ramifications of where we are now. So I thought it was important to go and learn for myself. I like to go places that our government may have a certain perception of that may or may not be true and, and witness it for myself so I can come back and tell other Americans how it really is. Um, so yeah, the first time I went this time last year, the thing like John that stuck out to me were the people. Um, Iranians were very lovely, very friendly, hospitable. Um, everyone we met, you know, once they found out we were Americans, they love Americans, they wanted to take their pictures with us, they wanted to exchange contact information. Um, they were very open, you know, to talk with us about things, even politics, you know, uh, things about their government, things about our government, people were very um, forthcoming uh, with us. Um, so, you know, being able to come back and um, dispel those myths was really important to me. Uh, another thing, the first time we went, and, and the second time I went, uh, one of my favorite places we went to is the Tehran uh, Museum of Peace. Um, the first time we went, uh, one of our delegates created this beautiful book, her name's Barbara, of all of the names of uh, the passengers who died on Iran Air Flight 655, which was shot down by the United States Navy on July 3rd, 1988. She created this lovely book with all of their names written in Farsi, also included poetry, since Iranians love poetry. We all you know, had personal messages um, of apology and presented this to the director of the, um, the Peace Museum. It was very, very moving. Um, they were very touched because the United States had never formally apologized for doing that um, at that time. Um, the first George Bush was vice president, and he said, I don't care what the facts are, America, we are never apologizing. So we apologized on behalf of our country. And at the end, the director said, I hope when you come back in the future, you come back in friendship and not to have to apologize for your government. So then I returned in October, and it was in friendship, I felt, and it was another lovely visit, and you were there too, Ariel, and you can talk about the Peace Museum if you want to. <laughs> it was very lovely. So I think we have a, a couple of quick questions before um, I totally want to talk about the Peace Museum, but uh, Leila, I'm going to pose this to you. Somebody is asking, they're saying that they lived in Palestine for a number of years, and would they be denied entry to Israel, Palestine, um, after getting a visa? And I guess I can answer that one and say that you can get uh, multiple passports. You are able to get a second passport, and that would solve that question, and that's what I would recommend for that. But then they also asked, would they worry about any danger from the U.S. government? And they might also be meaning any danger from the Iranian government. And I, I want to, you know, be very clear that I think many of us attending this call have watched some of the things that have, some of the news that has come out of Iran over the uh, past months, including the um, massacre of protesters and a number of crackdowns. And so, uh, Leila, I want to pose that to you as a question of general safety for our delegation, keeping in mind that um, Iran as, as a government is moving to the right, and we have seen some terrifying things in the past months. Yeah. 
You are, you are absolutely right. First of all, um, I think Ariel, you said it well about the passport. So people in the United States can get multiple passports or at least two passports, definitely. And if they ask why in the passport agency, the, uh, you will tell them the truth that you wanna to travel to Israel, Palestine and to Iran. And there are many countries in the Middle East they cannot travel to Israel, Palestine with the same passport. Um, that travel to other countries within the Middle East, like Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, or other places. Um, so this is um, on this, but also if you are in danger from the either American government or Iranian, um, I don't think so. I, I'm an Iranian American. I, I travel to Iran many times in my return here. Nothing has happened to me. And I know many of my friends, Americans who traveled to Iran and came back to America, nothing happened to them. Probably very basic question that why did you travel there? And you can say the reason and nothing has happened. But the danger from Iranian government, um, I personally, I would say no, because nothing has happened in the past more than 10 years that I've been involved in this field. But also I want to explain, not based on experience, but also based on what I think about the situation. Iranian government are very you know, harsh and right-wing, as Ariel mentioned, or going toward more right, um, just to their own people. They are not good government to their own people. And for many reasons, we can talk about it for hours and hours that what caused that, why is the reason or what has happened or all of those things. And we can discuss this later, but they never have harmed besides hostage crisis, but they never have had harmed the, <laughs> any foreigner in their own land in, inside Iran. And if they issue you a visa, that means you are free to go there and you are safe when you get there. So um, hopefully when you decide to go to the trip, I can uh, share with you a couple of documentaries or a couple of um, experience of other people uh, that people even got sick in Iran and they were been taken care of by the Iranian um, hospitals and doctors without even paying a you know penny for for that. So we have a wonderful hum, human humane experiences and stories that we can share with you. But also, I don't think Iran, another reason that I, I think it makes a good sense is Iranians don't Iranian government don't want to get engaged in a war with any other nations or any other countries. And they know well if they harm any Americans or any um, person from other nations for no reason, they can be in danger themselves. Um, so that could be another reason. But as I said again, in, yes, in uh, demonstrations or in uprisings or whatever we want to name it, um, in last November that many people also lost their lives, many Iranians, so often they are harmful to their own people, unfortunately. The people who are also, we shouldn't forget, they are suffering because of sanctions, because of threat of wars, and they are dealing with a very, very difficult time and also their government have ultimate pressure on them. So the short answer to your question is no, you shouldn't be worried that you will be harmed by the Iranian government or people there. If they don't want you, they don't issue a visa for you. <laughs> yeah, having traveled there twice, I felt very safe, more safe. And I've been to several countries in the Middle East. I felt safer in Iran than I did any other country in the Middle East. And even safer than the United States, to be completely honest with you. You know, there's a very low crime rate and crime against foreigners is even lower. Exactly. And, and, and I'm, thing, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I just, sorry, I just want to mention this little thing that some people, especially people who are Jew and they are Jewish, they are always worried that because we hear it from the Western media that Jewish people are not safe over there. And so Ariel is Jewish. I know that. <laughs> and John is as well. Yeah. And you are Jewish. So there are many people. And um, I actually I, I am aware and I led a delegation of rabbis to Iran. 
and we had an interfaith, wonderful interfaith conversation with clergy in Iran. So don't worry if you are Jewish. So I want to pass it over to John, and I, I'm Jewish as well. But uh, John, what was it like for you as, as a Jew to be in Iran? And we hear a lot about anti-Semitism in Iran. And um, I mean, anti-Semitism exists everywhere. But so I want to ask you your experience um, right. being in Iran yeah. as a Jew. Right. Yeah. As, as you know, because we were there together, there were four of us <laughs> in our delegation of 12 people. Four of us were Jews. And... Uh, as you recall, the first thing we did on the first day was go to shul. <laughs> we went to a synagogue and uh, we were there during Sukkot and we, the people treated us the way they would treat anybody. They were fine. They, I, I never felt anything <clears throat> that even remotely resembled anti-Semitism. People were just very open. We, I'm Jewish. I'm Muslim. Hey, that was it. It was, there was nothing that made me feel like I need to hide this or, or people treated us any differently. And I think there's kind of a, a, a misperception that some of the political rhetoric that we see and some of that, the anger, which is, you could say it's it's real. There's anger, political anger against the, the state of Israel, against the government that does not transfer over to whether it's an American Jew or just a, a Jew from any country, um, at least not that I experienced while we were there. And as you know, this is a topic, religion, that it came up on a number of occasions in a number of different settings. And it was just something we discussed and it wasn't a problem and it was nothing I felt I had to hide in any way whatsoever. The people, as Amber said, and as you would say, the people were incredible. They were incredibly welcoming and even more so, they were so surprised when we told them we were Americans, because as you recall, we did not see any other Americans except for a few Iranian American people who were visiting like Layla. Um, but when they saw Americans, they were just, they were, they, they said, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and visiting. Welcome. Mm -hmm. So that's all I really have to add there. And I want to point out that on that delegation, and as you said, there were 12 of us, there were 12 people who applied for their visas. And in that case, and this isn't always the case, but in that case, all 12 of us had our visas approved. And so I just want to assure people that uh, while there certainly isn't a guarantee, um, Iran is not the most easy country to travel to. I want to remind folks that it, it's most likely that you will get your visa. And so I want to encourage folks to go to codepink.org slash Iran. And at the top of the page, you will see the link for the delegation to go ahead and pay your $200 deposit and fill out and please fill out immediately your visa application. Um, I see we have another question. So it says uh, somebody is asking, so far it seems that anti-Iranian sentiment is everywhere, especially in the West and here from folks who should know better than be brainwashed by Western media. So I want to pose this, I think to, to Layla in this case, and Layla, I know that um, I've heard from you recently, the, the type of Islamophobia that you experienced when you first immigrated to the US and how it's important um, to, to show Iranians who Americans are and to come back and as Americans um, and tell the stories of who Iranians are. Yes, um, this actually, I think, um, is the most, to me, is the most important part of your trip. And that is when you are coming back here at home and deliver the message that, you know, who did you meet? What did they say? And also our mission as a citizen diplomats, our mission starts when we get back here at home and make the change we want, you know, show our photos to our community and go and talk to our representative. And if there is any um, anything happening by our senators, by our representatives, support them in making the peace. And also when you are there, that is very important to take your photos. You know, I always encourage people, take your family photos, your wedding photos. And because we people, we 
two people of Iran and the United States, the first thing we think about one another, we don't see each other as regular or normal people because already our government dehumanized us. Already we see an evil from one another. But when we see each other in person, we know that we share a lot, a lot with one another. So I encourage you to take your photos, family photos, you talk about your stories, your school days, your whatever that you, you will also see a lot of Iranians will share them with you. And so that is our mission. And also it makes it much easier for people after us to, for the next generation, for people who are much younger than us. Because for me, as Ariel mentioned, when I came to this country, I was very surprised then that people ask questions that at first I thought they are joking, but then I found out, no, it's real. They are really asking those questions. And it was the same when I came to this country. I came here and I was very fearful that what I'm going to see, because America was very scary. American people were very scary. But little by little, I learned everything I've heard was not true. And everything I've heard, it was based on the dehumanization process that our government here in the United States and there in Iran, they wanted us to hate one another. So these trips are very important. And so I, I believe not only you will see the 5,000 years of history when you go to Iran, not only you see the thousands of years, you will taste the thousands of years of cuisine, and not only you will see variety of people, like you will see dark and light people, you will see people with very different accents, we will see people from you know, Arab Iranian, Turk Iranian, Kurdish Iranian, you will see many different groups of people. And besides all of these beauties, you will see that they are as normal as us here. And they have the same dreams and the same aspirations as we have here, which is the most important um, reason we, we encourage you to go to these trips. And hopefully in your return, you will do more because you have the first-hand experience and you can do more and building the peace and reconciliation between these two nations, basically two governments, <laughs> because nations already, we, we really don't have that much problem with one another. So we're coming up on 45 minutes. Time really flies. And I want to thank everybody for their questions. Um, I see that there are more questions. Somebody asking about the recent elections in Iran. And I want to um, encourage folks to now direct those questions to Leila. That's L-E-I-L-A at codepink.org. If you have specific questions for John or Amber, or myself about what it was like to travel to Iran, uh, you can ask Layla to connect you. And I am sure that John and Amber, and I know myself, are happy to answer any questions. And so uh, before we end this webinar, I want to remind folks that you can apply to go on the delegation at codepink.org slash Iran. We do have partial scholarships available for young activists of color, and you can also donate to these scholarship funds. And the deadline to apply to participate in the delegation is March 14th. So before we end, I would like to ask, uh, we'll start with you, Amber, and then you, John, uh, last words on why people should be encouraged to go to Iran and then Layla, we'll, we'll finish with you. I think you should go to Iran to uh, learn and meet the pe learn about the country and meet the people for yourself. And as Layla described, to come back and be really be citizen um, ambassadors of what you learned. Uh, you can talk to your local uh, press, write articles, do talks. Um, uh, you know, contact your your politicians. You know, there's so much that you can do upon returning that can hopefully gear us towards a real peace. John, final thoughts? Sure. Yeah, I, I would second that. Um, there, as I said earlier, there's there's no substitute for going there, 
by yourself or, or with the group and, and seeing for yourself uh, what Iran is like and for making those connections with people. And you'll probably find that you'll be, you'll come back with a very different uh, impression of what you might've had beforehand. And it's really valuable for people, not only in Iran to experience contact with Americans or people from other countries who normally wouldn't go, but for you to come back and to be able to share those experiences, as Amber said, with other people, you, you just can't, there's no substitute. So it's, it's, it's amazing. It's fun. It's enlightening. It's, it'll open your eyes and uh, go. If you're thinking of going, go, if you can go, go. Thanks. So I see Mara saying that she hopes she can come though. She's recovering from a recent hip surgery. And I want to remind folks uh, I think I typed this in earlier that many uh, such situations can be accommodated, but please contact Layla, that's L E I L A, at codepink.org with specific questions. And Layla, final thoughts as the organizer of Code Pink's citizen diplomat peace delegations to Iran before we close. I think Amber and John said it well. Thank you very much. And um, I'm looking forward to a day that we won't need a visa and we won't really need all of these fears or all of these questions. We can just hand in hand dance and sing with the people of Iran and people of America and everywhere, people from everywhere. And um, I think it is really important to take action these days. It is really important for ourselves and for people over there, 80 million people who are suffering from crippling sanctions and whom every day wake up with, the, with thinking that maybe today is the day the bombs will you know, drop on us. And people who have lost their hope somehow and we need to meet them in person we need to hold their hands and remind them they are not alone. And we also, to, to ourselves, that we are not alone in this world and we have each other and we are going to be successful in the path that we have in front of us. And that is only peace and reconciliation with others. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. A special thanks to Amber and John, uh, previous delegates and co-leaders of Code Pink Delegations to Iran. Uh, please contact Layla at codepink.org and uh, find the link to sign up at codepink.org slash Iran. And we look forward to taking you by the hand to showing you the beauty and hospitality of Iran and, and helping lead you to become a citizen diplomat for peace with Iran.